Hello and welcome to Opinionated Season 2. In each episode, we'll take a controversial subject, present the arguments for and against, and then discuss what our audience thinks about the matter. This time round, just under 9,000 people answered our survey, which touched on four areas. Universal basic income, nuclear power, university tuition, and the UK's constitution. We're going to be releasing the episodes throughout May, but that doesn't mean that you have to wait. You can check out the full series on our website right now and watch all of the season immediately. Silver Level Patreon backers have automatic access to the full season immediately, so you can either get access through Patreon or just pay $3.99 to watch all four episodes ad-free right now. For a little extra, you can also get bonus content and access to the full dataset. More information can be found in the description. According to a House of Commons briefing paper, the UK currently has 15 nuclear reactors at eight different plants, generating about a fifth of the UK's electricity, with a further 13 at various stages of production or planning processes. So why has nuclear power come back into the foray of politics? Well, all bar one of the UK's existing reactors will be shut down before 2030, and only one plant, Hinkley Point C, has been granted final approval to build two reactors. With a net zero emission target by 2050 now on the statute book, questions are invariably being asked about how we're going to get there, and whether nuclear will be a major part of our future energy mix. Nuclear power is an extremely politically sensitive topic, with the Scottish National Party and the Green Party both opposing it in their 2019 manifestos, with the SNP opposing all nuclear power plants and prioritising investment on cleaner, cheaper forms of electricity generation, and the Green Party calling for a prohibition of the construction of nuclear power stations, with them saying that nuclear is a distraction from developing renewable energy. Both the Conservatives and Labour support nuclear power, with the Conservatives supporting gas for hydrogen production and nuclear energy as important parts of the energy system, alongside increasing our commitment to renewables, and Labour committing to build new nuclear power needed for energy security. In 2011, Germany decided to close all reactors by 2022, with Angela Merkel telling reporters at the time, our energy system has to be fundamentally changed and can be fundamentally changed. We want the electricity of the future to be safer and at the same time reliable and economical. For the UK, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy has three main aims when it comes to energy, security, decarbonisation and affordability, often referred to as a trilemma. So in the context of this trilemma, what are the arguments behind the politics for and against nuclear power? Well, first things first, decarbonisation. The UK was one of the first major countries to commit to net zero emissions by 2050, doing so in June of last year. And while the UK is making good progress, our energy generation remains a sticking point. According to the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, in 2018, carbon dioxide emissions from power stations accounted for 18% of all of our carbon dioxide emissions. Advocates would argue that if the UK is serious about meeting its carbon and emissions targets, it must urgently pursue the renewal of existing and expansion of new nuclear power stations. Nuclear power is very low carbon, with low emissions more generally. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that the average full life cycle emissions of nuclear are below those of all fossil fuels and some renewables with most emissions in the life cycle of a nuclear power plant arising from its construction. By kilowatt hour of energy, nuclear power has a carbon footprint of around 15 to 50 grams of CO2, gas of 450 grams of CO2, and coal of 1050 grams of CO2. According to the Times, a government leaked paper stresses that a fleet of nuclear or carbon capture power plants equivalent to a dozen Hinkley Point C's will be required to meet Britain's emission targets, something backed by the Nuclear Industry Association. When it comes to the affordability aspect of the trilemma, levelised cost estimates from projects commissioned in 2025, including all construction, maintenance and importantly decommissioning costs, 
known as life cycle costs, put nuclear at £95 per megawatt hour, quite significantly under an open cycle gas turbine at £189 per kilowatt hour, and just under offshore wind at £100 per megawatt hour. But it does cost more than large scale solar at £63 per megawatt hour, and large offshore wind at £61 per megawatt hour. The issue here remains security, the last aspect of the trilemma. We, as of yet, don't have a reliable large scale battery solution to store up electricity. Most renewable sources, including cheaper large scale solar and offshore wind, are condition dependent. A solar panel will only generate electricity when the sun is shining, and a wind turbine only when the wind is blowing. Nuclear power provides baseload power, the power always demanded regardless of external factors. Renewables are not yet able to take on this baseload. In the United States, according to the Energy Information Administration, in 2019, nuclear power had a capacity factor of 93.5% in effect, meaning that nuclear power operated for 341 days out of 365. By comparison, hydroelectric had a capacity factor of 39.1%, or 142 days a year. Wind had 34.8%, or 127 days a year. And solar had just 24.5%, or 89 days a year. That's not to say that they won't eventually be able to, or that the constant dependability is a panacea. A wide-scale adoption of electric cars, coupled with initiatives like Tesla's Powerwall, could act as a distributed power bank, known as vehicle-to-grid technology. During the night, when electricity demand is relatively low and electricity is cheap, cars will be plugged in and charged up. When demand is high, say at the end of a long-running TV soap, charging would then reverse, dumping electricity into the grid. All in all, stabilising the flow of energy coming from renewables. The UK currently does something similar, using pumped storage hydroelectricity. Electricity is used at periods of low usage, and therefore low cost, to pump water up a hill, typically into a reservoir and then it's let through turbines at peak times, generating new electricity. While pump storage is relatively efficient, it's far from scalable, relying on geography ahead of anything else. However, nuclear cannot be ramped up and down fast enough to cater for significant fluctuations in energy demand, and therefore it alone cannot be the solution we need. Then comes the issue of energy interdependence. The UK remains a net importer of electricity. In 2018, the UK imported 13.3 terawatt hours of electricity from France, 6.4 from the Netherlands, and 1.7 from Ireland, exporting back 0.4 to France, 0.2 to the Netherlands, and 1.6 to Ireland. For some, the scalability and concentration of nuclear power presents the UK with an opportunity to go alone. A House of Commons report from 2006 finds a certain irony in the argument sometimes used to support nuclear new build in the UK that the UK should not be so dependent on foreign supplies of natural gas when it may become equally dependent on uranium imports from similar foreign sources. With the UK's eight power stations producing enough power to support 50% of households, and seven of them being decommissioned by the end of the decade, advocates would strongly support increasing nuclear power rapidly. But there are a number of explicit arguments against nuclear power, the biggest being risk. The aftermath of the Fukushima and Chernobyl nuclear disaster remain in the minds of many. Nearly a decade after the Fukushima disaster, more than a million tons of contaminated water remain in storage, with the expectation that the contaminated water will have to be drained into the sea and diluted. When it comes to Chernobyl, a 2005 report by eight UN agencies, as well as the governments of Belarus, the Russian Federation and Ukraine, concluded that up to 4,000 people could eventually die from radiation exposure arising from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. As of 2008, 1.8 million people in Ukraine alone were considered victims of the disaster by the National Research Centre for Radiation Medicine. 
However, the tectonic movement that caused the Fukushima disaster is extremely uncommon in Europe, and after both disasters, more stringent measures were adopted internationally. Then comes the general radiation and disposal. According to the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, living within 50 miles of a nuclear plant, you would receive on average 0.01 millirem a year. The average person in the US receives over 300 milligram a year from natural background sources. The long-term implications are much harder though. Permanent disposal of radioactive waste has yet to be achieved by a single country. The long-term costs are, according to some, greatly underestimated, with current decommissioning practices merely a sticking plaster with a selection of countries including Finland, Sweden, France and the United States proceeding with deep geological disposal, building extremely deep caves for permanent storage. Many argue that without a long-term solution, nuclear should have no place in our energy mix. Similarly, when it comes to price, critics would say that as the price of true, clean, renewable sources are tumbling down, it will be daft to back nuclear power, when time after time the prices and difficulties are going up. After all, three separate planned plants have fallen through. In 2018, Toshiba closed its new generation subsidiary, the unit behind a proposed plant in Cumbria. In January 2019, Hitachi suspended work on a plant in Anglesey, citing rising costs, and another one in Gloucestershire until a solution can be found. Evidently, there are issues. The question is where? The funding structure? The supporter? Well, most of the costs are upfront in construction, with costs increasing in the light of safety concerns and the potential for terrorist attacks. And while partially offset by lower running costs, the National Audit Office states that investment in nuclear power have a very long payback period. When it comes to Hinkley Point C, the only active project in the UK, costs have continued to rise. In an initial report, EDF put the cost at £16 billion. By 2015, this had risen to £18 billion. By July 2017, £19.6 billion. By September last year, it was between £21.5 billion and £22.5 billion. The National Audit Office, in a recent report published in 2017, claims that the department did not assess the potential value for money implications and opted to negotiate bilaterally, rather than waiting for competition, and has not sufficiently considered the costs and risks of its deal for consumers and Greenpeace in 2016 went as far as to call Hinkley Point as the most expensive object on Earth, passing £24 billion. But does one project mark a systematic failure? Many object to increases in nuclear power from a position of principle, wanting to pursue a truly nuclear-free world. Many people retain concerns that increased dependency on nuclear could allow for nuclear weapon proliferation, in spite of all civil nuclear power stations being subject to international inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency and in Europe by Eurotom. So what does our community think? Well, the vast majority of you, some 68.7%, support increasing the use of nuclear power. The majority of you, 58%, back a move towards nuclear, funded by the public sector, with 16.1% believing that it should be led by private companies first and foremost. When it comes to compensating those living near nuclear facilities, you were quite split. 54% of you backed compensating them and 46% were against it. So what do you think? Is the risk of a disaster too much to warrant building more plants? And are our net zero targets attainable otherwise? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to keep watching and find out what our audience thinks about these other topics, then be sure to head over to our website where you can claim access to the full series through Patreon, or just pay to watch the whole series ad free. Thanks for watching and thanks for supporting TLDR News.